time for me to go back to the start to give you the basics. No matter if you've been painting miniatures for 15 minutes or 15 years, the very first thing you're going to do with every color on every miniature is a base coat. So it's high time I give out an information overlord about how to get the best out of your base. X. And as always, I'm going to need an assistant, so I've chosen something a little larger with lots of potential for color, and the most important thing, I like how it looks. And that's the Snake Man from this month's One Page Rules Mummified Undead Offering. There's lots of little detailed parts, but also lots of large ones to show off how to cover all these surfaces sublimely. One of the common mistakes I see with beginner painters is a belief that because the miniature is small, so must the brush be. However, the most important thing for a base layer is actually an even coverage. And because small brushes don't cover a large enough area for what you might be painting, as you paint, the paint starts to dry quickly before you've finished covering the whole surface. Meaning that you could end up ripping up half dry paint or have fresh paint pool against dry paint, which is one way the phenomena of thick paint can happen. So we need the right tools for the right job. I personally have four different brushes that I'll switch between. A large flat brush, which tells you its job right in the name for base coating large flat areas. A large brush or number two round. The large size and shape of this brush can hold lots of paint, but also still form a fine point so can do most of the work of base coating evenly and quickly for most surfaces. A medium sized brush. This one is more of a personal choice, but I prefer a more straight bristle than a round one. So a brush like this holds a little less paint and doesn't spread as far, which is useful for getting into harder to reach areas. Its length also allows me to use just the tip to deliver paint, reducing the chance that I get paint on other parts of the model, since the bristles of that part of the brush would be clean. Lastly, a fine detail brush. While it's not common, some things, yes, are so small that you need a fine detail brush to get them properly. So please don't feel called out by me by what I said at the start of this section for using one, because there are places where only a fine brush will do. I'll paint its headdress here to show the usefulness of each brush, starting with the large flat. I can swiftly put down a base layer of this raw sienna. Even near the edges of the surface, I can use the edges of the brush to get to and cover them. With the number two round, I can come at the inside of the headdress from the side at an angle with some purple allowing me to get behind other parts easily to lay that paint down. With my medium brush, I'll rebase the plate surfaces using a yellow ochre, staying away from the valleys of the plates. But also down at the bottom here, add the purple I was using earlier on just the tip of the brush to base those visible undersides without worrying about getting it on other parts of the model. And lastly, the fine detail brush to pick out these rings and rivets with a slight blue-gray, the small area needing a fine tip. Though for some splendor, I can also use the fine brush to line some of the edges, separating parts to have them feel a bit more separate. Another common mistake for beginners, and one I think is perpetuated by miniatures paints companies, is the idea that all colors in a paint line can cover the same. But that's simply not the case, because all pigments are made from very different things. Professional artist lines like to tell you up front if a paint is going to cover well or not. Watch my video on using Liquitex paint for miniatures to find out how they do that. But it means you have a good understanding about which paints will cover well and what won't before even putting any on the palette. Which is important because the less coats we have to do, the less likely we'll end up with thick paint. For those paints that aren't very good at covering, it's almost always better instead to create a base coat for your base coat. Red and yellow are good examples of tricky paint colors, since they seem like they go on nice and opaque, but once dry, end up being very translucent. So to help those colors along, we'd first want to base with a more opaque version of those colors. You've already seen me do this once with the yellow. I started with a raw sienna, a dark opaque yellow, then covered it with yellow oxide. We could even go up to a vibrant yellow for something even more saturated. Red is the same. An earthy red or dark yellow brown will have more coverage, but then allow you to follow that up with a nice bright red. 
whereas over a black or gray, it might take three or four layers just to get it consistent. Red also really loves white for true bright reds. So by making things white first, you'll get the most vibrant red possible after just a few coats. This is also why I prefer priming a model with a neutral gray, because that way it starts in the middle of the lightness scale instead of at an extreme at either end. So it can be nudged to be darker or lighter more easily than having to make something light from a black or dark from a white. Because most miniatures paint companies don't really tell you what pigments are in their mixes, it can leave you guessing as to what's opaque and what's not, but I can give you some basics to watch out for. Black and white are some of the most opaque colors, but even then going from one extreme to the other would be difficult. But that means a mix of the two is quite potent, and desaturated colors tend to be quite opaque. Earthy colors like browns and red and yellow oxides are usually opaque and anything like earthy greens that include them would be too. Blues, emerald greens, and purples when dark are less opaque than lighter counterparts, since those colors have been mixed with white to make them brighter. Same goes for if they're really dark, since then they'd have been mixed with black. And lastly, vibrant reds and yellows are semi-opaque, meaning over lighter colors they'll be more opaque and less opaque over darker colors. What that means in a practical sense is that you want to create mixes for base coats that use more opaque colors to help along those more transparent ones. By mixing in a bit of black, brown, or white, you'll end up with a base coat that goes on more easily and in less coats than without. For my model example, I'll use a phthalo green. While it starts pretty dark, it doesn't actually cover all that well. But if I mix in some yellow oxide, raw umber, and a tiny bit of black to darken it again, it'll cover much more smoothly. Then if I wanted it just a bit more vibrant, using the idea of basing for the base coat from earlier, I could then go in with a phthalo green to make it saturated again. Skin and bone are also paints that can be a bit inconsistent with coverage. That's because skin colors are usually made from white, reds, and yellows. So something like a pink skin made from white and red oxide will cover better than a golden skin which is made from white and saturated reds and yellows, which are only semi-opaque. Bone is in the same boat since it can be made with opaque browns or translucent yellows. So here, I would say get in front of it. Start by adding some opaque brown into the bone color and make a base with that before going over it again with a pure bone. When it comes to consistency and what it should be for painting miniatures, there's one golden rule that gets told the most often, and that is that you have to thin your paints. But I don't tell that. I've known people to paint right from the paint pot just fine, or use glazes to build up over xenophil primes, also just fine. Heck, I use heavy body acrylics in my everyday painting, which is paint that's thick on purpose. So instead of just telling you that you need to thin your paint, we're going to do an experiment so you can figure out how much you feel you need to thin your paint to get the look you want. My plan is to base coat four of these bands with the same color, but different fluidity of paint. I'll use my large brush for one coat even coverage, starting with getting the paints ready in a weld palette. The reason I'm using a weld palette instead of a wet one is that so no additional moisture makes its way into the paint. I'll add paint to four wells as evenly as I can. The first one I'm going to leave alone. That's just going to be paint from the pot. In the second one, I'll add one drop of thinner. The third gets two drops, and the last one gets three drops. Each time, washing and drying my brush completely so they don't cross-contaminate each other. Though, in normal painting situations, I wouldn't care too much about that. Then each one I'll paint one band of the Snake Man's Tail armor section starting with the thickest paint to the thinnest. I'm using red oxide since this is the base coat for the vibrant red which will come next. The thick paint went on opaque and with a bit of back and forth relatively smoothly, though it doesn't spread as easily into the hard to reach places. The semi-thinned paint became immediately more transparent, though still with good coverage. I will say that it was also the fastest section to dry, even faster than just paint on its own. The thinned paint was a bit of a trickster as it looked like it was going on really opaque until I swiped my brush over it again. It isn't any less opaque than one drop, but still nothing like the paint alone, though this was very easy to paint and even out. 
The super thinned paint behaves more like a wash, where it pools against the edges and the sculpted scrapes this armor has. Because of that, it dried a little bit uneven when it comes to coverage, but it was the most flat, paint from the pot being the most thick, as would be expected. While applying these layers, I was very generous with the load in my brush before getting it to the model, but now that I have that first layer on, I want to repeat the process for the vibrant red using the same kinds of ratios as the first mix, but wicking out the bristles of the brush with each one on a paper towel before applying. I also evened out the oxide with a few more applications, so they started generally even again. The raw paint, once it had been evened out in the bristles, actually became really hard to get the paint to flow off of them. You can see I have to stroke a few times just to get it out. So even though it does come out very opaque, there's a bit of a thickness issue when done this way. The semi-thinned paint retains most of the same properties as the raw paint, but just flows a little bit better from the bristles. It is only slightly less opaque. Though it is still a bit thick, it becomes easier to even out while painting over the surface. The thin paint flows out nicely and smoothly. Here's where we start to see a breakdown of the thickness issue, but at the cost of transparency. However, a second or third coat can fix that issue. It just takes a few more passes. The super thinned paint, when wicked out, actually covers nice and evenly too, but is much more transparent. And so it would take quite a bit of layers to get this to the same kind of coverage. So to summarize, a bit of thinning is going to help your paint cover more easily. But I think the big secret isn't actually found on here, but instead here. The real skill to a good base color is to apply it evenly and repeatedly. Not that the paint needs to be some kind of perfect consistency. If you overload the brush with thick paint, you could end up with lumps. And if you overload the brush with thin paint, it could pool in corners and edges for an uneven finish. But whatever thickness of paint you use, if you apply it evenly over a surface, the natural properties of acrylic polymer will be to tighten up as it dries, meaning it should always dry smooth, but needs to be applied smooth for that to work. With all the basic principles taken care of, all that's left to do is finish the rest of the model. I was using the yellows as a substitute for metallic gold, so the first thing I'm going to do is finish up with all the gold parts. I'll use my medium brush to take care of the wrist guards on both of his arms, painting them the raw sienna first, then using the yellow oxide as a second layer. I'll use the same brush to do the same color on every band of his tail armor, just the ridges, separating each of the red parts. And lastly, his belt. I'll use the medium brush on most of it, but switch to the fine detail brush to paint the edges and sides of the trinkets that hang from the belt and armor. The trinkets and gems themselves would be a good time to have fun and play with colors, but I'm keeping it within the little color scheme I got going on here, and use a purple and a bit of white mixed, the white helping with the coverage, but also making the gems a little brighter, using a fine detail brush to fill them in. The mouth I'll fill in with some pink, made with white, red oxide, and red, with paint just on the tip of a medium brush, also giving the tongue a base coat of this same mix to be a base for something a bit darker after. Using just the red and a tiny bit of white, I'll make a dark pink for the tongue, and cover the tongue with it in a few good coats. The teeth get a similar two-step process of first being painted with a white and raw umber mix, then I'll mix much more of the white into it until I have a bone color and paint the teeth finally with that. Since I have those browns on my palette now, I'll use them to paint the staff. The main body of the staff I'll cover with the raw umber, using a large brush for it, but swish to the fine detail one just around the hand. His hand looks like it's holding onto some leather at the top here, so I'll use some burnt umber to paint that, using my detail brush for it. Even though the gold rings around the staff are quite small, because they're so round, they'll actually be easier to paint with the medium brush, since it will conform to that curve for an even coverage better than the fine detail brush will. And lastly, the blades. I'll use a mix of black and white and a tiny bit of blue to make a gray silver, but then take half of it to darken with even more black. For the under half of the blades, I'll paint them using that darker gray. Since this is a mix of black and white, it should have no problem covering anything using just my medium brush for it. Then the top edges that would be facing the light more, I'll use the lighter gray with my medium brush again. No matter what miniature you might be painting, 
If you've made it as far as I have so far on this one, then I have just two things to say. Congratulations, and welcome to this wonderful hobby. There's certainly much more to learn, but there's not a single master out there that didn't start with something like this. So be proud of what you paint. If you want to take things a bit further, I have another video about all the techniques that come after the base coat to get you started with that. But the most important thing you can do is just paint, because no teacher is better than your fingers actually doing the things you want to learn. Please subscribe if you'd like to see more videos like this one, or just other fun things to do with painting miniatures. And until next time, enjoy your own painting journey.